Uh, Master Cutler, uh, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my very pleasant duty to welcome you to the university and to the 54th Hadfield Memorial Lecture. Before I ask uh, Professor Knott to deliver his lecture, please allow me to do two things. First, to tell you something about William Hadfield, whose name and work this lecture commemorates, and second, to tell you something about our distinguished lecturer. Dr. Williams Herbert Hadfield was a native of Sheffield, as I think you all know, born here in 1882. Uh, after leaving school, he went to work in the laboratories of Henry Bessemer and Co., and he became a student of this university, then University College Sheffield, both as an undergraduate and postgraduate, winning a Mappin Medal in 1902 and being conferred the degree of Doctor of Metallurgy later. He became director of Firth Brown Research Labs and later joined the board of that company. His scientific output was prodigious. I actually logged onto the Royal Society website and uh, saw the, the quality and the range of his output. And he was the author of many papers in several branches of metallurgy, in particular rust, acid, and heat-resistant steels and cast iron. And the very high quality of his scientific contribution was reflected in his election to a fellowship of the Royal Society. In 1944, a year after his death, the university agreed to become the trustees of the fund which was set up to establish an annual lecture in his memory. Uh, the lecturer is appointed formally by the University Council on the recommendation of the lecture committee whose members come both from this university, uh, the Royal Society and the Institute of uh, Materials whose current president we're delighted to have with us uh, this evening. Tonight's lecturer, Professor John Knott, is the 54th lecturer, as uh, must be clear by now, and he continues the long line of very eminent lecturers which it has been our good fortune to attract. Uh, Professor Knott is Professor of Metallurgy and Materials at the University of Birmingham uh, and a Fellow of Churchill College, Cambridge, where he has been Vice Master. But he had the very good sense to start his scientific career here at Sheffield. Um, so we are the beginning, John, of your very successful career and we're delighted to welcome you back again. He read Metallurgy here, graduating with First Class Honours in 1959, which he followed up with a PhD in Cambridge in 1963. There followed a very distinguished career, both at Cambridge uh, and at Birmingham. His scientific output, um, in parallel with uh, his uh, distinguished forebear, whose name we commemorate tonight, has been very distinguished, reflecting in his election to a fellowship both of the Royal Society and the Royal Academy of Engineering, and the winner of many prestigious medals and honours um, to uh, learned and professional societies, both here and abroad. He has also made major contributions to industry including the nuclear and aerospace in industries, and was made OBE in 2004 uh, for his services to nuclear safety, um, an area, uh, John, where I suspect there is a long career to uh, be pursued, given the imminent announcements of Her Majesty's Government about nuclear submarines. So we have with us tonight someone whose achievements both to science and industry make him a very worthy Hadfield lecturer, and now I, I now invite John Knott to deliver the 54th lecture, which he has entitled Quantifying, Quantifying the Quality of Steel. John. <clears throat> Pro Vice Chancellor, Master Cutler, President, ladies and gentlemen. As you will uh, have deduced from when I graduated, it was uh, exactly 50 years last October that I entered this university as an undergraduate. 50 years ago, this week and next week, we sat our first end of term exams in physics, maths and chemistry. And I just warn anyone who is likely to cause trouble in the audience that uh, if they do, they will have to stay behind afterwards and sit these examinations. <laughs> Peter Twig and Phil Whiteley will have sat these and may or may not be able to be of some assistance. <laughs> My title, Quantifying the Quality of Steel. Sheffield is the home of quality steel. But we really need to know how good it is. What do we mean by quality? And in particular, how can we quantify it 
in a way that is of value both to its use in engineering application and to relate it to the metallurgical microstructure and other features of impurities and so on. In my uh, abstract, I pointed out that many previous Hatfield lectures had addressed various bits of this uh, conspectus. What I want to try and do tonight is, is to pull them together. Well, if we start with dictionary definitions, we all know what is meant by quality, grade of goodness, high grade of excellence. And uh, that's a good start, but how do we quantify it? Uh, in passing, by the way, it, under the definitions uh, are also people of the upper class, and I can see that we have many of those in the audience. On the other hand, as Molière put it in French, I wasn't going to put it in French, but uh, people of quality know everything without having been taught anything. And uh, that doesn't apply to you. The slight problem is then when you look at the adjectives of qualitative, which says relating to or concerned with quality, it says it's especially opposite to quantitative. So am I bashing my head against a brick wall and trying to quantify high quality? Well, what I've taken is an operational definition, which is simply to um, take quality as a rather wordy bit, ability to continue to fulfill design intent when subjected to diverse threats to integrity encountered in service. And this is the application of steel in engineering applications. So uh, it's not just beauty being in the eye of the beholder. It's more handsome is as handsome does. Is it fit for purpose? Will it, will it, will it last? Well, um, I think we ought to look at some of the ways in which um, steels are used. I've taken five uh, areas, more or less, uh, at random here. But I shall mainly concentrate on structures where the loads are, we will talk about a little later, but basically a structure is something like a bridge or a building, or it may be an airframe which moves um, in a translatory mode, but is supposed to stay pretty well only elastically deflecting and, uh, and not uh, doing anything else. Machines definitely have dynamic components, rods, pistons, gears, and so on turning around, and that brings in other uh, things like fatigue and so on. Fairground rides take us to the uh, extent of thrills without uh, spills. Uh, we are subjecting ourselves to things outside normal, uh, comfortable uh, existence. Even a bouncy castle, the deflections are much bigger than you get in life. And there are some pretty horrendous uh, fairground rides around. There's also the question of often traveling fairgrounds have to be dismantled and remantled so that you uh, have to worry about uh, the construction aspects. I've included musical instruments. Uh, you might think there's not many of this, a steel band perhaps, but uh, in fact some of our strongest steel is used in piano wire. And uh, one of our most common experiences, if, if you ever play a violin, of a catastrophic failure is uh, when you're overtuning the string and it breaks. And the design intent there is quite different from what it is in, in say, structures, in that what you're trying to do is to put enough tension in the wire to be able to resonate at, uh, and give a particular frequency. Musical instruments delight in resonance. Structures and machines are applications where resonance is to be avoided in most cases. And then there are all the uh, art and architectural things like the uh, Millennium Bridge, the uh, London Eye, Angel of the North, and so on. So there's a number of functions. I shall concentrate mainly on structures, a bit on machines, and, and uh, so on. But that's the uh, conspectus. Well, I'm going to do three things. I'm going to look a bit at some historical looks at quality and... Uh, then some engineering quantification of quality, and finally some microstructural quantification of quality. And I thought I would start with a good blade or two. Uh, swords with a long history. The quality has proved in battle, 
although I suspect that the wielder of the sword has something to do with it as well as the sword itself. But swords have given rise to a lot of uh, mythology and of a lot of uh, folk history. And of course, there are a very famous uh, blades, as the Damascus blade uh, with the wood steel or pattern welding, uh, famous throughout uh, the, the Middle Ages and in the Crusades, the Saracen blades and so on. The uh, Japanese blades and uh, later T Toledo blades. Uh, interestingly, uh, an English fox uh, was, was, we will see in a minute, uh, a mistaken uh, name for uh, Toledo blades in Shakespearean times. And there are, of course, it, it's so full of it that there are legends, genuine legends like Arthur's Excalibur, or Siegfried's Balmung, or in The Lord of the Rings, we have, again, swords as rather special uh, objects. <clears throat> now, this is uh, to honour the Japanese swordsmiths, so we go from right to left. First of all, just to look at the quality of the forging and of the hardening of the outside surface along here. Uh, a clear example here in Agincourt of uh, swords being put to the test by uh, swordsmen. Rather interestingly, in the background, you've got some non-ferrous metals being used for musical instruments to blow the horns. But the real battle is going on here, and one is testing out one sword against another. There is a little reference to Agincourt in uh, Henry V, uh, where a pistol has captured some Frenchman and is talking about the point of my fox, which is actually a Toledo blade. And that was popular in Shakespeare's time, and he wrote this in 1600. Uh, whether they ever used those blades in 1413 is, is more doubtful. Um, Shakespeare's not awfully reliable on, on historical fact. I tried to find out. I sent an email to the armourers and braziers, but they, uh, I haven't got a reply yet. Um, but um, there comes the question of how would you quantify this? Lef myth and legend are all very well, but how will we actually quantify it? Do you do it like conquers? You know, I've killed off 25 infidels with this sword, and then if you kill an infidel who's killed 12 Christians with his sword, is that 26 or is it 37, you know? <laughs> and is an infidel the same weight as a Christian? And how about giants and ogres and dragons? You know, how do you rate them in? So although we have ideas of quality, and we know what good quality is from its proof in battle, it's not really quantifiable in the way that I would like it to be. If I move forward some 70 years from Shakespeare writing Henry V, then the man who knew quality better than anyone else, one might say, was Christopher Wren. Uh, what you might not have known is that he was into steel bands. Well, actually, they were iron bands, but they served a very important purpose. When he was building St. Paul's, he was building a dome. And a dome has an outward thrust on it. And a very good way of maintaining that thrust is to put a chain around the bottom of the dome to hold it in. And this is actually the type of chain that Wren used for Salisbury Cathedral, but it was much the same for St. Paul's. And he did it well. And St. Peter, the Pope, Benedict XIV, had problems with St. Peter's dome in 1743 because their chains weren't so good. And if I use Wren's words, I can't guarantee this is his handwriting, but it looked like a nice typeface. Um, it does say, for St. Paul's, although the stone needs no butment, yet for greater caution it is hooped with iron in this manner, a channel is cut in the bandage of Portland stone, in which is laid a double chain of iron strongly linked together at every 10 feet, and the whole channel filled up with lead. So that's how he did it. And then in Salisbury Cathedral, this is really quite important. Note these irons will be best wrought at some port town where they work anchors and other large work for ships. For I have found by experience that large work cannot be wrought sound with little fires and small bellows. And that is a point that I think is going to come back 
as I go through this talk. I shall pick it up a little bit later. The third piece of history I want to go into refers to a rather delightful facsimile of a book by W. Fordyce in 1860, which I picked up in Newcastle about uh, 30 years ago as something connected with the Beamish Museum. He has a definite statement in here. The quality of a bar of iron may be tested by nicking it on one side and then breaking it or doubling it down at the notch. If the iron be cold short, it will break off at once with the blow of a sledgehammer, but if it be a good quality, it will not break but bend double. A very small amount of phosphorus will make bar iron brittle, cold short, and sulphur has been assigned as the cause of the red short property of wrought iron. Fascinating book, mainly about coal and coke, but there's some wonderful chapters at the end about iron, and Mr. Bessemer Steele does feature uh, giving mechanical tests. Remember, that came out in 56, and uh, he's got data for it, along with Swedish irons and other such things at the end of the book. So that's the historical bit. What I'd like to do now is to uh, just have a quick revisit of steel and the duty it might have to face in, uh, in service. There's an awful lot of things to consider, structures, there's dead weight, live loads, traffic, loading it, wind, waves bashing into uh, bridges, tensile loading on cables, buckling. The Saturn rocket is supposed not to be able to sit on its bottom stage because it's so thin that it would buckle. It's all right when it's taking off and uh, it's got pressure inside it. All sorts of things to consider, cyclic loads for machines and so on, musical instruments and so on. Uh, those are the normal things that one guards against. More and more, particularly when one's, one's looking at safety cases, you start to say, what about the other things that can occur, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune? Natural phenomena like earthquakes, volcanoes, acts of war, terrorism, and then some other bits that come in through human factors, and some of the failures that we've seen in the past have been due to uh, not looking at the problem properly, uh, not looking at the erection of a structure in the same way that you would look at its design, and a number of pieces of human fallibility. I have four little pictures here just to show some of these. First of all, emphasizing the uh, uh, things that are going on in fairgrounds, sorts of stresses that are put on that. The uh, Angel of the North down there, I think Ken Rydell let me have this slide originally, this Angel of the North down here, and what forces might come on that when we get some heavy snow again, uh, aerodynamically designed, structurally designed, one doesn't know. But a couple of the major sorts of hazard that one has occurred with this uh, Milford Haven and other bridges, battery's gone up, but um, simple loading these box girders out, too much bending moment, and the thing buckled. But I think one of the most amazing uh, incidents of this sort occurred in 1996, when the Erskine Bridge, which had been across the Clyde for a considerable number of years, was run into by an oil rig, which was being taken down to the Captain Oil Field. And, you know, you've got to feel sympathy for the designer of the bridge. <laughs> Things were supposed to go under the deck, not through it. And uh, those are human fallibility problems. So let's do something very, very simple. Let's have a very simple design. We know that um, if we have something like a simple strut there as um, taking load, that provided the loads aren't too big, that the thing will just deflect elastically. So if we have uh, a person of slender build going across and one more slightly weight challenge like myself going across, then one can get a plastic collapse. Instead of elastic deflections, we have the whole thing collapsing. Well, when you put in the geometry and the design codes and so on, what this implies is that one quantitative measure of quality is a steel's yield strength. Because to design against plastic collapse, 
what you have to put in is the yield or the flow strength. And that's a quantitative measure of quality. We can design cross-sections. We can make sure that things don't collapse. We can control loads to make sure that there are load, loads on bridges, for example, are limited. And that is quantitative. It is a quantitative measure of quality. And we can actually design structures so that we have these as a fraction of the yield strength of the material which we develop. And of course, there have been many previous Hatfield lectures and much research going into the science of what contributes to strength and to hardness in materials. So we have a first design which has to do with plastic collapse. The problem comes if our structure fails at something below its design load. And this is what we would refer to as an engineering brittle fracture. The actual microstructural mode of failure is less critical than the fact that it breaks at a load below the design load, which is some fraction of, of the collapse load. And the only way that you can get this is if you have stress concentrations, which may be geometrical stress concentrations or crack-like defects, because then you can have locally yielded regions which uh, allow fracture to occur before collapse. And the general picture is that if you have a discontinuity like a crack and you're loading it, you can think of all these as elastic strings, like the atomic bonds all stretching elastically, and there's no resistance across the crack. It will just deform by being pulled on one side. So to transmit force from one side to the other, you have to take a detour around the crack tip. And clearly, the level of stress depends on how much you're putting on at the outside, and the concentration depends on how big the crack is, because the longer the crack, the more detours all these lines of force have to take. You see similar things with uh, electrical current flow if there's an insulator there, or with uh, water flow if there's a dam in the middle of a river. So this has been understood for quite some long period of time, and to an extent is taken on board in one of several types, but common types of trying to assess the quality of steel now, not just with a nick and a sledgehammer, but with a nicely machined notch and an automated sledgehammer. Uh, the difference is that you do it at different temperatures, and in general, for ferritic steels, you find that there is a transition from brittle behavior at low temperatures to ductile behavior at high temperatures. And uh, that's fine, and you can attach numbers to that. The question is, what value are these numbers? The fact that you have a number doesn't necessarily mean that you have something that is quantitative use. The two things you might um, characterize are the transition temperature going from brittle to ductile behavior, or the energy absorbed at a specific temperature. But you can't really use these in a proper engineering design or assessment sense. It gives a relative rating of a steel's quality, but not whether or not it's fit for a particular application. If you go to steel grades, for example, you've got all these specifications getting more and more uh, rigorous as one goes from A to D. And uh, the question you still have to ask is, if I've got a given application, are they all good enough, are none of them good enough, or are some of them good enough and others not? And you've got all this nice rating but you can't really tell whether they're fit for purpose. You might find industry would ask the same thing about metallurgical undergraduates with their different levels of degree. <laughs> so what we want to try to do is to look at something that gives us more quantitative nature on the quality of steel. And again, this is about 50 years uh, old, that um, George Irwin simplified the work that Griffith had done in the 1920s, and looked very much at the stress field ahead of a crack. And basically, he looked at the strength of that stress field and uh, found that, with a number of geometrical terms in, it was basically related to the applied stress and the crack length to the 
to the 0.5, square root of crack length. So we saw earlier with the picture of the bonds that the stress concentration at the tip would actually be dependent on the stress level, and that as we made the crack longer, those things would have to bend rather more, and it turns out that it goes as the square root of crack length. And that's an elastic analysis, but what is actually incredibly important is that if you only have a small amount of plastic deformation, sufficient to move dislocations and to initiate cracks and so on, that the plastic zone size and all features of the plastic zone are also dependent on the strength of that stress, elastic stress field squared. And so it is a, an incredibly good descriptor of the behavior of uh, cracks with some plastic zone ahead of them where things can go on and initiate fracture. Here you see the uh, photoelastic pattern for a crack in polycarbonate with the principal stresses and the shear stress regions. And here you can see a plastic zone ahead of a crack. And if you look at these uh, grids on here, you can see that this is slid open relative to that. So the development of that has produced an important further parameter uh, for a material's quality, its ability uh, to resist fast fracture. And it's now reduced to a standard technique, which uh, Mick May and uh, Bizra in days of yore had a, a very big role in setting up in this country. And basically, you have standard test pieces, you know the crack length, you measure the stress it breaks at, and you calculate the critical strength of field at the crack tip at which the things broke. You can then go into an assessment situation of a structure, and usually what you know there is the applied stress from the stress people who've designed it, so that's the design plus major stress concentrators. You know your material's resistance to crack extension from the fracture toughness test, and you can calculate the critical sizes of defect that are of importance. And then you can, uh, in general for structures, go to your non-destructive testing people and say, make sure that we can eliminate cracks bigger than that, that critical size. So we now have a second measure, a second quantitative measure of quality, and that is the material's fracture toughness. And I think the next two graphs are quite, quite interesting ones. One of these simply plots the applied stress against the fracture toughness and shows the sizes of defect that might be critical. And uh, this green line shows the resolution of 2 megahertz uh, ultrasonic um, testing in uh, structural steel. And you can basically divide this up into areas. When you have our pressure vessels with relatively high toughness, we've got, we're talking of 25 millimeters, one inch or bigger for the defect size. When we're looking at aerospace materials with relatively low toughness, then we are down in a region of the order of, of a millimeter or less. And for buried defects, we can't guarantee that we can detect those by ultrasonics. So that's a very useful division, and it just so happens that the uh, three millimeter line goes, goes across the graph. But the more usual way of assessing a structure is to take into account both the quantitative measurements of material quality, both the yield strength and the fracture toughness. And we have this failure assessment diagram which plots a ratio of the applied strength of a stress field to its fracture toughness over the applied load to the load for plastic collapse. And basically, you assess a structure in terms of where you sit. If you're this side of that line, you're on the safe condition. If you're on the other side, uh, it's fail. And the safety margin is given by the ratio of these two lengths. And that uh, R6 procedure has been now widely adopted as a means 
of assessing the safety of structures using these two measures, these two quantitative measures of material quality. I haven't got time really to go into subcritical crack growth, but I would just like to make the point that uh, from our simple pictures of cracked opening and what new surface is created for environmental interaction, then both in fatigue cycling and in steady loads, either creep or stress corrosion, we can relate the crack growth, increment of growth, to the instantaneous value of the strength of the uh, stress field at its tip. So that's just a, a, an overall little look at uh, the, the uh, macroscopic engineering side. What I want to look at now is what we can contribute on the microstructural side to these quantitative measures. I've talked already about the extensive work done on hardening mechanisms and yield strength, and I won't repeat those because they are in previous Hatfield lectures of one sort or another, giving rise to all the different hardening mechanisms. So I'll concentrate on the fracture toughness side. And here we have to face one of the problems with ferritic steel, that it can behave badly from time to time. Uh, something like 1,100 Liberty ships and tankers and so on split up in the Second World War. 14 or 15 bridges across in Belgium broke in a brittle manner. And in particular, of concern to uh, pressure vessels, is this John Thompson pressure vessel, which uh, under its just over-pressurization over test had been badly heat treated, and this thing shattered in a very brittle manner, and this two-ton piece flew 67 meters, 158 feet, into the car park. Clearly, one has to worry about things like this. What can we contribute? Well, it's, it's really a three-scale process, or two-scale process. We have, on the one hand, the major engineering issue. As an intermediate, we have the measurement of the engineering quantitative measure of quality, the materials fracture toughness, or equivalent. And then we have to find out what's going on at the tip of the crack here, the same as the tip of the crack there, to see what's going on in microstructural terms. One of the things I said in the abstract is that we've been greatly uh, aided in this throughout the past 40 years by, first of all, the development of electron optic techniques of, very so of various sorts, particularly the scanning electron microscope and all the information that we can get from local chemistry, local crystallography, surface chemistry, and so on. I've called this death of a sample because this is the fatal flaw, and what we're doing is forensic fractography, trying to sort out why it happened. And we can do this, of course, both in our test pieces and on bits of service failures to make sure that we're representing the right sort of failure in the test piece. Well, the second thing that, that came along that was of tremendous use was finite element analysis to work out the stresses and strains around stress concentrators. Uh, what this shows at the top is a crack fortuitously stopped, but how I've managed to do it in a, in a ferrite microstructure. And you will see that it has initiated from a piece of carbide, and there's a little crack there and a little crack there that never quite made it. But initially, without it, it was a bit difficult to get the sums right. But with the development of uh, finite element analysis, one can actually work out what the stresses are in something with a stress concentrator in it like that. And it's quite remarkable. The stress-strain curve at the root of the notch is like that. The effective stress-strain curve, say half a millimetre below a Sharpie notch, is like that. And this is why the brittle fractures occur down here. Very high tensile stresses with very little plastic strain. Well, one can work out what happens as a function of temperature. You can deduce that the stress required to propagate cracks is relatively independent of temperature. And depending on whether you break at general yield or at some small amount of 
plastic deformation. So you will get different uh, conditions for failure, and you have to go to a higher value of yield stress, i.e. to a lower temperature, if you haven't got so much elevation of the stresses by the elastic plastic stress field ahead of the march. That general picture can be taken forward to uh, fracture toughness, and uh, it was developed really by David Curry in about 1979, uh, but without very convincing fractography. And the, frank the fractography came along with the study of fracture in weld metals, started by James Tweed, where you could actually see the initiating sites and analyze them on the fracture surface. The general picture that we have is that plastic deformation initiates a little brittle crack into a particle, which may be a carbide, it may be a deoxidation product as um, an inclusion, or it may be titanium carbonitride. Here we can see the fatigue crack tip. We're looking down onto the fracture surface here, and we can see where the river lines radiate outwards from, and there is an inclusion which is cracked. Um, and here's another picture which shows that the thing uh, does, uh, that the, the thing where it's perfectly well. Here's again a site of initiation of fracture, the two matching halves of the fracture surface, and the inclusion is clearly split in half. And we can apply all those bits of uh, surface analysis to find out what the inclusion is, how big it is, and match it up to the stresses. So that was the basis of the uh, model for fracture toughness as a function of temperature for the cleavage end. And uh, this is uh, how it came out. It basically, fracture toughness goes up as the yield stress goes down. But it would be unbounded were it not for the onset of ductile fracture. And uh, the reason that ductile fracture occurs is that when you're opening a crack, there is a strain gradient ahead of the tip and you open up voids around non-metallic inclusions, and these link together. That's a nice model system of uh, free-cutting mild steel. As one goes to higher strength steels, you can see the crack opening, but you will see that a lot of shear is involved in linking uh, voids together. And this, which is that bit there, shows that there's actually a fine-scale linkage between carbides. And as one goes to higher and higher strength steels, and they make them cleaner and cleaner from the point of view of inclusions, it turns out that this linkage between carbides is the important feature. And then there are questions about what happens when um, a ductile crack uh, changes to a cleavage crack, and that's basically that it accelerates, and the strain rate goes up, and the real stress, therefore, goes up. Interestingly, in weld metals, you can blunt out one set of potential crack initiators and they have to start from something else. Well, that's uh, the basic cleavage and ductile fracture. I would like, at this moment, just to pause and to think about William Fordyce in 1860 and phosphorus making iron coal short, and go back to our times as undergraduates, where virtually every two weeks we went out to a steelworks here, and occasionally went up to Glasgow. It was surprising that every steelworks that we'd been to had always had an accident three or four weeks before, and somebody had always fallen into the ingot mold. The odd one had managed to get out by jumping off the crust, but was never actually seen. But this happened time and time again. But I think the most poignant story was the one at an unknown Sheffield steelworks, where they said, Look at that ingot up in, up in the stockyard. You want, there's a story to that. It was about 12, 15 years ago when X jumped or fell into the ingot mould. And that was it. So we offered the ingot to his widow. But she said, no, keep it for the war effort. We hadn't the heart to tell her that this was a high-quality forging steel and that the extra phosphorus that had been put in it 
made it unfit for purpose. <laughs> but there's wonderful things one can do these days to quantify the effects of trace and purity elements. This is from a paper last year in Material Science and Technology from uh, Rengin Ding, Sujin Wu, Amin al-Islam and myself. And it shows what Rengin can manage to do in picking up phosphorus peaks across going boundaries. It shows that we can tie up the TEM phosphorus with OJ phosphorus. And it also shows that the local cleavage stresses start to go down beyond a certain amount of phosphorus concentration. So that's one thing that we're doing that's quite exciting. The second one I want to draw to your attention is nuclear pressure vessels. And I would note that Calder Hall was open, 50, delivered power to the system 50 years ago, 17th, 18th of October. Here, there are some very interesting phenomena, things that were known about once they got the units right. Um, smashing into the lattice, making slip difficult. An unknown finding that you could get copper precipitation hardening at 300 C rather than about 450 or 500 because of the extra point defects from the neutron irradiation. And one of the consequences of that was that the size well pressure vessel was made with a great big ring forging so that no welds were within the heavily irradiated region in the barrel region because the copper came from submerged arc welds. And that presents a major problem. If we go into a new nuclear build program, there's only about one place in the world that can make these big forgings in Japan, and there's a great long queue for them. And so a challenge that I'd put to Richard uh, and uh, to the TWI is we've got to get round to uh, looking at this case to see the fact we've had hundreds of welded pressure vessels, can't we have some more? Otherwise, we ain't going to get any nuclear uh, pressure vessel for a long period of time. But wasn't Christopher Wren uh, prophetic in his statement? Large work cannot be wrought sound with little fires and small bellows. So to make these big ring forgings, you've got to have big equipment. We don't have it, and most of Europe doesn't have it. But another issue that came up was segregation of phosphorus to grain boundaries. Not so much a problem with, with our, our Western ones, but the um, Eastern European reactors have had a lot of problems with, with phosphorus embrittlement. Um, and if we want to look at this schematically, we can see that there are two sets of effects. There's the hardening from neutron irradiation and copper precipitation that pushes up the yield stress. There's the embrittlement that lowers the local fracture stress and various transitions according to whether it's just hardening, just embrittlement, or a combination of the two. So that's a, a, a number of issues that are of excitement. Uh, many of the safety cases rely on very low probability events. And here, one looks at the defect size that might be in a component and the critical defect size deduced from the fracture toughness. The critical area of overlap gives you the probability of failure and this is where you have almost no information because they are low probability events. And one of the things we've been looking at very carefully on TAGSI and, and other uh, sources is the validity of extrapolating data sets to very low probabilities of failure. Um, in particular, when one has spatially heterogeneous material. Uh, if you treat such material as being all of one uh, one uh, sample, then you get a very wide statistical variation. And when you extrapolate down to 10 to the minus 4, you can actually get negative fracture toughnesses. So one needs to put the metallurgical understanding into the spatial heterogeneity, how this affects toughness. And there are so many examples. There are, there are weldments, there are inclusions, there's trace impurity elements, and there's also texturing. I have to mention this last one because much against my will, some five years ago, Claire Davis dragged me into a program in conjunction with Sheffield, with John Bynan and uh, Derek Lincolns and Ian Howard,
to look at the causes of variation in release values of Sharpie energy values, things I've been trying to get rid of for the previous 40 odd years. However, we made some sense of it, and we did find that some of the fine ferrite in some of the controlled old pipeline steels is in fact textured so that its resistance to cleavage fracture isn't what you would think it would be from its, uh, from its grade size. Whilst harping on about the Sharpie, I may say that the Steel University, which may or may not have come about, sent out a brochure, and on the back page was all this modern uh, mechanical testing with a picture of the automated Sharpie uh, sledgehammer. But uh, that's enough. So as far as the topic of my talk is concerned, what I've tried to do is to look at quantifying the quality of steel in two different ways. One, looking at its fitness for purpose, handsome is as handsome does, for fatigue design, where we have the two quantitative measures of quality, and we can assess their importance in a failure assessment, and that is modified by any subcritical crack growth, which affects crack length and hence affects both stress intensity and collapse load. The second time, I've tried to look at a microstructural quantification, and we know that the yield strength is affected by various hardening mechanisms. I haven't had time to do that today. But I have looked a little bit at some of the features that contribute to fracture toughness, and most of those now we are getting a handle on to quantify in a genuine sense from um, microstructural features, sizes of brittle particles, uh, spacing of inclusions, and so on. There are these spatial effects still where I think metallurgists have a great role to play in engineering assessments, because otherwise people who are either statisticians or fracture mechanics uh, type engineers will get it wrong, and they mustn't get it wrong. Right. Um, sometimes you don't have an ending. I've got three endings, and I couldn't choose between them, so I'm going to give them all three. The first one is heart heartfelt, but sounds a bit pious. And that's why I wasn't going to learn just this one. But taking the, uh, the motto of this university and what is on its book, I think that has served me well throughout life. It comes from Felix Qui Potuit Rerum Cognoscri Causas. It says here that the translation in the Oxford Book of Quotations is, lucky is he who has been able to understand the causes of things. Mm -hmm. And I certainly regard myself as very lucky once or twice. The alternative is happy is the man who's able to understand uh, the, the reasons for things. And I've certainly been pretty happy in uh, trying to do that. And the other bit, the disque doke, learn, teach, is I think absolutely vital. The whole idea of a research-led university is, of course, that you learn and you teach. But I may say, over experience of um, many years of teaching, both lecturing but also in small tutorial classes, one finds that when you have to teach something, you actually learn it much better than you ever did before, particularly if it's something that you haven't taught before. So I regard that as a two-way traffic, a very important one, and the character of what should be in a good university department. So that was my first ending. My second one is quite personal as well. Quantifying the quality. You might be querying the cues as quirky, quixotic, or whatever. It follows in a sort of weird alphabetical sequence from some of my mentors. Cottrell went for the M's in Materials and Malthus. Roy Nichols and Peter Hirsch went for the N's and P's in both uh, nuclear power. And Q follows from that. But from all of us who were in the department in 56 to 59, there was only one Q, and that was Arthur George Quarrell, who gave this lecture in uh, 1963. We knew that he had regular conversations with God. <laughs> we never knew who gave instructions to whom. <laughs> and with, of course, Q, I would like to bracket H, who gave the lecture in, I think, 79, because Robert Honeycomb has been my mentor and strong supporter over many years at Cambridge and, and uh, in, initially in Sheffield. So those are down memory lane. There is no O in that. 
And my last one brings us back to the uh, nature of this, this lecture and remembering uh, the quality of a bar of iron from Fordyce. And the O, most sadly, is Graham Oates, who was a great friend of mine uh, and died back in the spring of 2005. Graham was from Sheffield and was an undergraduate at, uh, at Birmingham and PhD at Birmingham, Donald Wilson. And uh, he did a pre-university experience at one of the quality Sheffield steel firms. It may have been Steel Peach and Toza, it may not have been, I can't remember. But he started off actually doing the Nick test. This is 50 years ago. And he said it was very exciting. I had two of them to do it. One of them had a little notching machine, a little nicking machine, and the other one wound up this guillotine up to its height, and then one of them put the thing in and got their hands out of the way quickly, and this guillotine thing came down and broke it. And what you then did was you picked up the broken halves, you looked at them for 15 seconds, you threw them into a bin, and you put a tick on a list that said, Nick Test Done. <laughs> Well, Graham was an inquisitive guy, and after a couple of days, he asked the, uh, the, the, the senior guy who was there, he said, uh, why are we doing this test? Hey, lad, he said, I don't rightly know. I, I, I think it's to see whether steel's good enough. And Graham said, well, yeah, but how does this information help that? He said, you got me there, lad, but I do know one thing. We've never had a bad one yet. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, Master Cutler, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm Richard Dolby. I'm uh, chairman of the Hatfield Memorial Lecture Committee, and it's my privilege to say thanks to John. Um, so. Yet another famous son of Sheffield has uh, delivered this uh, important lecture. And uh, I've known John 40 years, I think. And uh, like many who meet him professionally, uh, I've long been a great admirer of his intellect and talent. Uh, I count myself lucky to have had him as a PhD supervisor many years ago, because uh, he successfully steered me through that task when I was trying to hold down a full-time job. And, uh, so it's a particular pleasure for me to pay this tribute to him, and more so since this is uh, during my presidential two years for the Institute of Materials, Minerals, and Mining. Whilst I was lucky, I think John would have considered himself lucky to have studied under Sir Alan Cottrell at Cambridge, his first mentor, perhaps. For this was, uh, I think, a period where he was able to, and um, was introduced to the fundamentals of, of fracture, uh, in a very special way, uh, which I experienced as an undergraduate there too. And uh, John has carried that knowledge uh, and never forgotten it during his long career as a consultant and an academic. And as you know, he's built a, an immense international reputation in the field of mechanics uh, and mechanisms of failure, and is one of the giants, in my view, on the, on the world stage in this field. And for those who, who didn't know, uh, he was honored by many of his past students in the United States with a special symposium, uh, and uh, that was a really special occasion for John, I know. And of course, he's received many honors in countries such as Japan, China, uh, India, and so on, as well as the UK. One thing about John's uh, uh, approach uh, that's is very clear is that although his activities have focused on fundamental fracture knowledge and uh, mechanisms and mechanics, what he's also done is really devoted much of his career to the application of this information uh, targeting the prevention of engineering failures. And uh, perhaps not enough material scientists and metallurgists uh, have attempted this bridge between what we might call materials behavior and engineering reality. And certainly few have had the success that John has had in uh, getting into the Royal Society as a fellow and the Royal Academy of Engineering and getting this double distinction, which only a handful of our, our, our community has. So one of the examples which I 
would like to mention, and he himself uh, touched on it, was the, his contributions, uh, well, he didn't mention his own contributions, but I know there have been many in the field of nuclear power plant safety. And this is relatively unknown to many of you, but I can vouch for it, and, uh, and it has been outstanding work from him. Now, I, I've had many years of experience sitting in committees with John, and uh, uh, one thing is clear, he's always authoritative and uh, usually right. And uh, so as a result, he gets uh, pulled into many industrial uh, committees, advisory committees and government bodies, uh, particularly those dealing with safety and reliability. And I know of many investigators who, uh, are due to make a presentation the next day, have had sleepless nights worrying about uh, difficult questions from John. And so I adopted a, a, a ploy uh, when at TWI uh, and tried on numerous occasions to keep him up uh, all night at the bar. Now, uh, that wasn't too difficult, but I never found it altered the sharpness of his questions the following day. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've had uh, a lecture from a man who's, in my view, outstanding and preeminent in his field, and it was a wonderful perspective of, of current knowledge. Uh, I think it reminded me very much of the way his first mentor, Sir Alan Cottrell, uh, who had a, a, a style of presenting complicated issues in a simple to understand manner. We haven't had a complicated lecture tonight, really. It, well, it was very simply presented, but there's a lot of important information and detail sitting underneath the way John presented it. So, John, thank you for, for that. Uh, it's been a, a most entertaining and enjoyable presentation. Your usual mix of quotations, wonderful micrographs, and entertaining style. And we thank you for that. And I'd like to present John with the uh, pewter bowl, which is made by a local metalsmith in, uh, in Sheffield, Keith Tyson. And uh, uh, I'll thanks John for a, a wonderful lecture. Thank you. Can I just make a few remarks about the lecture um, uh, organization and so on? Um, we can't run this event, which in my view is one of the largest networking events for materials people in this region, without the help of, of many sponsors. And you saw them on the slide at the beginning. University of Sheffield, the Sheffield Metallurgical and Engineering Association, the Institute of Materials, Minerals and Mining, National Metals Technology Center, and the worshipful companies of Ironmongers, and armourers and braziers, and finally TWI Technology Yorkshire. So I thank them on your behalf, and I should of course mention Chorus too, who also contributed. This event is mainly uh, about the lecture, but the networking around it is important, and if there are any companies out there who would like to be associated with this lecture and uh, help us keep this at the standard which uh, uh, it is at the moment, uh, please let me know. Uh, we always like to encourage more sponsors if we can receive them. I'd like to thank also Dr. Helen Fletcher and her team for uh, organizing this lecture for the first time. It's no longer held and organized through the ceremonies office of the university. It's done through the Department of Engineering Materials, headed, of course, by Tony West. And we thank you, Tony, for uh, the support that the department has given to running this event. Could I first lastly remind you that um, we've been trying to improve the, the information from these lectures uh, on our website. Now, there is a Hatfield Memorial Lecture website, and in the last two or three lectures, we've been able to put on videos of the lecture itself, uh, papers uh, as they emerge, and PowerPoint presentations. So uh, all these are available to you for the last two or three years uh, and, of course, before that, many of the lectures were presented as, as papers in, in, in book form. So uh, uh, we intend to continue this style, uh, and, and John's lecture will be uh, on the website very shortly, uh, certainly as a video and uh, supporting information. And so I would encourage you to uh, visit it and get your students, if you have them, to visit it too. And, uh, the URL, is, the address is quite difficult, but as I mentioned last year, if you go to Google and type in Hatfield Memorial, uh, it's number one on the list. So please do that. Next year, it's 
not a steel lecture, basically. It's a wider materials-based lecture. Every alternate year we have uh, steel. And uh, so it'll be a wider materials-based topic. And you will be hearing about that in due course. So that is the end of the evening, ladies and gentlemen, for the first part of the evening. I now uh, invite you to go to level four of University House for the second part of the evening, which is the, the buffet, and go and meet and greet your old friends and enjoy yourselves. So thank you very much. <laughs>